Now, to give us some context for our discussions today, it's my pleasure to welcome Permanent Secretary of State at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Iceland, Mr. Storla Sigurjonsson. Well, uh, Minister, uh, colleagues, other distinguished participants, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Dublin. Ireland is uh, uh, close to us Icelanders, even closer than many realize. Apart from the geographic proximity and frequently sitting next to each other in uh, multilateral fora and alphabetical order, uh, it has recently been scientifically confirmed by mapping the DNA of some of the settlers who came to Iceland more than 1,000 years ago, uh, that uh, they were almost evenly of Norse and Gaelic uh, ancestry. Uh, this is also reflected in the names of people and places in Iceland, and of course the literary heritage. But turning to the topic of the day, allow me by, uh, to start by saying a few words on Iceland's various multilateral responsibilities during 2019. This has been a busy year for us as we have had the honor to chair the Arctic Council, the Nordic Council of Ministers, the Nordic Foreign Ministers Cooperation, as well as the MB8 Cooperation. In addition, uh, a short term in the Human Rights, UN Human Rights Council uh, is coming to an end in December. Um, allow me to start in reverse order and reflect a bit on the uh, Nordic-Baltic cooperation between the five Nordic countries and the three Baltic states. The MB8 co cooperation started shortly after the end of the Cold War in the early 90s when Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania regained their independence from the former Soviet Union. Uh, these were dramatic days, uh, weeks and months following uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall the redrawing of the map of Europe and reshaping of the world order. The Baltic states sought close cooperation with the West, both in order to reiterate their European identity, declare themselves as democracies and free market economies, but also as a means to achieve economic and uh, social progress. For the Nordic countries, the Baltic states were natural partners, close neighbors with centuries of shared history, which had been unnaturally uh, shut off for decades, and now, 30 years ago, the door was open. Different fora for cooperation emerged in Europe, including uh, regional bodies. In Northern Europe, uh, uh, this, uh, these were, for example, the Nordic Council and the Nordic Council of Ministers. They had, of course, existed for decades, and they were there at the time. But additionally, we saw the establishment of the Council of Baltic Sea States, the Barents Sea Council, the UA, EU's Northern Dimension, and the MB8 Forum. The MB8 cooperation has two distinctive features. First, it has a relatively wide-ranging scope, meaning that these eight countries cooperate as MB8 when it is considered practical and mutually beneficial. Therefore, the MB8 cooperation uh, now includes different areas such as di digitalization, cybersecurity, and cooperation on human rights within international organizations. Secondly, the cooperation is quite flexible, sometimes even organic, but at the same time demanding, meaning that if the topic uh, at any given time does not provide added value for the group, it is simply allowed to fade away. The MB8 does not rely on a secretariat, and instead the countries rotate the role of coordinator, and the country concerned organizes meetings and up to a point uh, sets the agenda. Uh, accordingly, uh, Iceland put forward three strategic priorities. I, I, I'm not sure you can see them on the screen there, but, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, cover them. Um, and we did this uh, for the MB8 chairmanship uh, in, a paper, in a paper which uh, applied to, to this year. Um, and this focuses on continued security cooperation, including cybersecurity, uh, the importance of human rights, not least in the work of the Human Rights Council, where Iceland has had a seat. And finally, ocean affairs, where we have underlined the importance of preserving our oceans, securing uh, sustainable use of marine resources, 
and not least establishing the link between global climate change and ocean affairs. After all, uh, oceans do cover uh, over 70% of the Earth and their well-being is crucial to all climate action. This year we have had two ministerial meetings, the first in the MB8 V4 format together with the so-called Visegrad countries and the second as MB8 in Iceland a little more than a month ago. In addition to the meetings of foreign ministers and defense ministers, my colleagues, the permanent secretaries of the foreign ministries met in Iceland in March. The political directors have met as well and are experts on human rights, UN affairs, women, peace and security, Asia, Africa, arms control and many others. So as you can hear, it's, it, it covers a wide scope. So, um, uh, and a wide range of issues. Um, and I might add that this uh, cooperation is policy oriented, uh, meaning that we exchange information, knowledge and expertise, which often leads to or consolidates our like-minded approach on various issues. It can result in joint statements, uh, common initiatives or concrete action, um, such as, for example, uh, embassy cooperation in, in third countries, but it doesn't have to. Uh, the dialogue between us, uh, maintaining the link within the MB8 group has great value in itself. Turning to, um, I would just write, briefly like to talk about the Nordic cooperation as well. Uh, uh, this has deep political and historical roots, uh, but it has always been intentionally kept informal. The cooperation has evolved into being uh, so integral uh, to everything we do uh, that it has become almost an element in our foreign policy DNA, so to speak. The Nordic countries cooperate and consult effortlessly, uh, both formally and informally. The foreign ministers meet formally three to four times a year. And as a case in point, I can mention that they met last week in Berlin. Uh, the photo there was taken on that occasion. Um, and uh, they are meeting next week in Stockholm. Uh, on top of that, they meet one-on-one -on -one quite regularly and call and text each other all the time. So N5 cooperation is close. Um, again, it does not run on projects and primarily focuses on foreign policy consultations and cooperation top-down as well as uh, bottom-up. Um, but although this is primarily uh, policy cooperation, we also have various examples of how this cooperation has led to concrete results. I just mentioned Berlin, but uh, we have a good example of how the Nordic countries, uh, foreign services cooperate very closely in the Nordic embassy compound. Um, uh, in Berlin uh, with the effect that we are stronger together in, in Germany. The results of the cooperation are indeed greater than the sum of its parts. Another good example is the 2009 uh, so-called Stoltenberg re Report, uh, named after the author, the late Norwegian statesman uh, Torvald Stoltenberg. Uh, many of you may recognize him as, as the father of the current uh, Secretary General of NATO. Uh, back then, he was tasked to come up with proposals for closer Nordic cooperation on foreign and security matters, and he delivered on that promise. Now, 10 years on, many of his 13 proposals, which, uh, again, if you uh, have your glasses on, you might be able to read on the screen there, um, uh, they have, uh, in fact, in some cases led to much closer Nordic cooperation, not least in the, in the security context uh, in what we call NORDEFCO. Uh, and it's not a secret that the uh, foreign ministers uh, on the initiative of Iceland are currently explore, exploring the possibility of launching a further process, similar to Stoltenberg, which would produce new ideas and proposals for closer Nordic cooperation. A lot has changed internationally uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, new variables have emerged, um, and these changes have a substantial effect on our foreign policy and security environment. And this includes, of course, global climate change, uh, hybrid and cyber threats, uh, and increased, uh, increasing strains on multilateralism and, and the rule-based international order. Um, I'd also like to say a few words on the Nordic Council of Ministers and the, and the Arctic Council. Um, 
but these, these formats are similar but, but different. Now, let me start with the Nordic Council of Ministers. It's the Nordic Five, but also the regions, the Orland Islands, uh, the Faroe Islands, and Greenland. The Nordic Council of Ministers um, is a forum for regional cooperation, excluding foreign ministers, and including more or less all other ministerial cooperation in areas ranging from culture and edu education, social health and welfare, innovation, digitalization, and gender. The Nordic Council of Ministers is supported by a secretariat based in Copenhagen, consisting of up to 100 senior advisors on different topics, and it has an annual budget of roughly 128 million euros. These funds support a variety of joint uh, Nordic uh, projects, Nordic research, Nordic innovation, cultural exchange, education, and language. In our chairmanship, uh, Iceland has put emphasis on the youth, uh, sustainable tourism in the north, and ocean affairs, uh, but by far the biggest task during our chair has been brokering a new vision for the Nordic Council of Ministers, and uh, this uh, we succeeded in doing last August when the Nordic Prime Ministers endorsed a document called Our Vision 2030, which has climate action at its core and aims at making the Nordics the most sustainable and integrated region. Uh, finally, and uh, politically perhaps most visible today, the Arctic Council. Uh, this I say because uh, in this forum we have three other countries on, at the table, in addition to the Nordics, uh, the US, Russia, and Canada. Uh, many permanent participants, mainly representatives of indigenous peoples, and a large number of observers follow closely what happens in the Council. The Arctic Council is the main forum for international cooperation on Arctic issues. All its members focus on peace and stability in the region, environmental protection, and sustainable economic development. One of the key challenges we face in the Arctic is maintaining the balance between environmental protection and economic development. Um, Iceland continues to stress the importance of the Arctic, that the Arctic remains a region of peace, stability, and constructive cooperation, and this has fortunately so far been the case. And despite tension and divergence in international politics, uh, the Arctic uh, offers an example of how both large and small nations can work together within these defined parameters. Various projects serve as confidence-building measures. Others are linked to our chairmanship program, such as combating plastic uh, pollution in the Arctic Ocean, gender equality and the blue bioeconomy, meteorological cooperation, and uh, sustainable economic development, to mention only a few examples. As I said before, Arctic cooperation is increasingly important because it provides a semblance of governance on the basis of the UNCLOS and promotes communication and cooperation in a volatile region. A changing climate and the resulting opening up of sea routes, easier access to natural resources and possible security threats resulting from increased traffic in the area poses new challenges and makes it increasingly uh, important to ensure that the Arctic remains a low tension area. And this is best done through multilateral co collaboration and dialogue. Uh, the geostrategic situation in the region has changed. And uh, this reality is also reflected in the Arctic Council's international status and uh, the attention that the work of the Council enjoys. Uh, dear guests, um, I have briefly described uh, Iceland's chairmanships uh, in different formats, MB8, N5, Nordic Council of Ministers and the Arctic Council. And all of this runs in parallel to our formal participation in a great number of other international organizations where in many cases we work closely together with Ireland, with which we share fundamental values and frequently interests. And this raises the question of whether the MB8 and Ireland could somehow connect at the policy-making level. There are examples of, uh, of the uh, MB8 format being used to strengthen ties with other countries. I have already mentioned the Visegrad countries, but I might add that the United, United Kingdom has has also been uh, lately working closely with this, this group. The so-called uh, Northern Future Forum is held annually with the participation of the MB8 and the UK Prime Ministers, allowing them to focus on a 
specific subject at each meeting, uh, but also creating opportunities for closer networking. Um, a third example is the possible Nordic-German cooperation, uh, which is an idea that was launched during uh, Chancellor Merkel's visit to Reykjavik last August, where she met with Nordic Prime Minister and Ministers, and this uh, photo was taken on that occasion. But here, substance is the key. If it makes sense for the MP8 countries to meet with other countries in this format, and vice versa, uh, and if it is good use of our minister's precious time, we are generally positive. And given Ireland's numerous strengths in multiple areas, innovation, digitalization, new climate solutions, just to name a few, um, as well as the fact that uh, Ireland and the MB8 countries are like-minded on most issues, I'm confident that the potential is definitely there. In a rapidly changing world, characterized by uncertainties, uh, complexities, and also challenges to rules, norms, and values that have so far been taken for granted. Uh, there is a need for more international and regional cooperation. Uh, this is also, and perhaps more than ever, true for us who share these values and want to safeguard the rule-based international order. Thank you for your attention.